you like movies, cartoons, and anime? Then have I got the podcast show for you, featuring reviews. Bill and Ted themselves may be slow-witted, but they mean well, remain upbeat, and have a really wholesome friendship. News! We're not making this up. This is not an Onion article. (laughs) Tom Cruise is going to make a movie in space. Trivia! In the first draft for Pixar's A Bug's Life, Flick was originally a red ant called Red and performed for P.T. Flea's circus troupe. And games! In the Nightmare Before Christmas, what is the color of Zero the Dog's nose? It's orange because it's like a little jack-o'-lantern. Presenting my film and animation-themed variety podcast show, Jamboree Sandwich. Howdy folks, Jamboree here, and welcome to another episode of Jamboree Orange, the show where I let my patrons decide what I review. The options for this episode included The Lord of the Rings The Two Towers, American Pop, Shazam, Attack on Titan Season 1, Pan's Labyrinth, and Tentacolino. Gandalf, my old friend. This will be a night to remember. The adventure to destroy the One Ring and defeat the growing evil taking over Middle-earth continues. But with the Fellowship being over, everyone is divided into teams with their own obstacles to face. Frodo and Sam turn to the shady Gollum for help in getting to Mordor. Merry and Pippin befriend talking walking trees called Ents. Plus Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli are trying to find Merry and Pippin. Meanwhile, Saruman convinces Isengard to join forces with Mordor uniting two towers together to expand Saruman's army. This film may act as a build-up chapter in the trilogy, but it's also where the journey really begins. Everything that's come before was just a precursor to the deeper adventure. Fellowship of the Ring did have its own dark moments, but the two towers adopts a grittier tone in comparison. I'd say that the biggest theme it tackles is distrust and the division it can cause. With the Fellowship disbanded, it's now harder for our heroes to not only know who to befriend, but also equally difficult for them to convince those not associated with the quest to help. Three groups have been created, and each one is facing the challenge of trust. First, we have Frodo, Sam, and Gollum. Gollum is someone who suffers from dual personalities due to his obsession with the ring. One half is simple-minded and innocent, someone who resembles his former self, Smeagol, but the other is vicious and aggressive. The latter manipulates the former constantly until it gets its way. Why did you cry, Smeagol? <laughs> Cruel man hurts us. Master Tricksters. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> I told you he was tricksy. <laughs> Because Gollum has these split personalities and determination to get his ring back, Sam is extremely hesitant to let the creature be their guide, with Frodo's safety and the goal to destroy the ring being his main priorities. However, Frodo sympathises with Gollum, remembering what Gandalf had told him in the last movie. It's a pity Bilbo didn't kill him when he had the chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed Bilbo's hand. Many that live deserve death. Some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them, Frodo? Do not be too eager to deal out death and judgment. Even the very wise can see all ends. On the one hand, we can understand Frodo's need to show compassion. It's a noble gesture, but it's obvious that the ring is starting to take a hold on the young hobbit, and even Sam notices this. Does Frodo want to trust Gollum out of genuine pity, or is he letting the darkness of the ring dictate his better judgement? This is where Frodo starts becoming less himself. Something that's very easy to tell because we've come to know him as a gentle, kind and loving hobbit. It's quite startling watching him devolve into someone more abrasive and confrontational, disturbing even. He's exhibiting traits that strongly contrast against the Frodo we know. It's his gradual signs of a darker side that keep us on our toes, giving us a hero who is also his own enemy. A more internal obstacle that's perhaps equally as dangerous as any physical threat the Hobbits will face. Such a change in character adds so much effective tension to the film, because we start to question whether Frodo will end up being responsible for the ring not being destroyed. 
It's the ring. You can't take your eyes off it. I've seen you. You're not eating. You barely sleep. It's taking a hold of you, Mr. Frodo. You have to fight it. I know what I have to do, Sam. The ring was entrusted to me. It's my task. Mine. My own. Heck, Gollum is also testament to what Frodo could become. The end result of letting the ring's evil consume you. A stark reminder that the ring bears power to strip a person of their dignity and sensibilities. Interestingly though, Frodo and Sam's adventure isn't just about working out if they can trust Gollum, because other characters will question our Hobbit hero's moral compass too, including Gollum himself. You see, Frodo and Sam end up meeting Boromir's brother, Faramir, who is reluctant to believe that the two hobbits are anything but orc spies, especially when he suspects that they are being accompanied by Gollum, a character that Middle-earth has grown to despise. The film's theme of putting faith in others applies to all the characters, no matter who we're supposed to be rooting for, and I love that the movie is showing that distrust is a universal fear. In an extremely tense scene, Faramir's men corner Gollum with arrows, and Frodo becomes conflicted, having to explain his association with Gollum to protect the creature, while also reluctantly surrendering him to Faramir which makes Gollum feel extremely betrayed. Smeagol already feels dehumanized and alone in Middle-earth, then here comes this nice hobbit who believes he can be good, and even encourages him to stand up to his evil persona, then that same hobbit then turns his back on Gollum. So of course he's going to feel let down, regardless of Frodo's intentions. It's Frodo's unintentional act of betrayal that pushes Smeagol to trust his other personality once again, because Frodo has made him feel like he can't turn to anyone else. Now, I can't talk about Gollum without bringing up the landmark effects that went into him. You see, this was the first major mainstream use of motion capture, the art of translating a live-action performance into CGI. The magic of Gollum is a blend of both talented actor Andy Serkis and the hard work of CGI animators. The end result is a character that doesn't look quite human, yet displays a vast range of emotions and expressions. A strange fantasy creature that shows hints of the person he used to be before the ring consumed him. No! No! No, master! They catch you! They catch you! No, don't take it to him! He wants the precious. Always, he is looking for it! And the precious is wanting to go back to him. It's this visual effect that completely revolutionized film technology today, giving actors a chance to wear digital makeup that utilizes the imagination of computer animation, and prove that the motion capture process could be a legit movie-making technique worthy of Hollywood spectacles. Faramir discovers that Frodo bears the Wong Ring, and he wants to use it to help Gondor win the war against Mordor. He exhibits the same traits that his brother displayed in the last movie, hinting at the cycle of the ring being exploited by mankind all over again. The great thing about these movies is how they show that anyone can be a villain because of the ring. That's what makes it such a unique quest object. It can corrupt the innocent like Frodo, but it can also heighten the arrogance of a man like Faramir. It's up to Sam and Frodo to convince the Gondor steward that the ring needs to be destroyed. But he's too stubborn to listen, until he witnesses what the ring does to Frodo. I think at last... We understand one another, Frodo Baggins. You know the laws of our country. The laws of your father. If you let them go, your life will be forfeit. Then it is forfeit. Release them. Then we have Merry and Pippin's side of things. After the two hobbits escape the orcs, they come face to face with Treebeard the Ent. We once again have a test of mutual trust. We're not orcs, we're hobbits. Hobbits? Never heard of a hobbit before. Sounds like orc mischief to me.
You see, the ants are a very vivid metaphor for trees themselves, as Tolkien was very passionate about preserving nature and not abusing it for resources. I think that adding character to trees is a stroke of genius, because it's a really powerful way of getting audiences to empathise with the very environment that humankind cuts down. Though I will admit that casting John Rhys Davis, the actor who plays Gimli, as the voice of Treebeard, is a little distracting. There are efforts to slightly disguise his voice, but you can still tell it's him. I have told your names to the Entmoot, and we have agreed. You are not orcs. Well, that's good news. The fact that Treebeard and his fellow Ents have to question their place in the war is very poignant, because I never really see films that address the damage that wars have on the environment. And here's a movie that says that trees, the very life force of humankind, are also casualties in our battles. It's only when Treebeard witnesses the carnage caused by Saruman on his people that he realises the true scope of this war, and how every single race is involuntarily a part of it. This movingly ties in with Merry and Pippin's character arcs, because now they have to ask themselves what roles do they play in this war. It's sort of the same question Frodo asked himself once he brought the ring to Rivendell. These two have been reserved in the positions of sideline comic relief so far, but it's here where they become something more, because they realise that they have a Shire to protect from Mordor's wrath. It's a very deep moment for the duo, they have to put aside the jokes and really take in the severity of what they've got into. The fires of Isengard will spread, and the woods of Tugbro and Buckland will burn. And, and all that was once green and good in this world will be gone. There won't be a Shire Pippin. This is a brilliant step forward for the duo, one that's been organically inspired by their time spent with the Ents. So what about the third group? Well, in order for me to talk about their plot, I need to explain the bigger picture about what's going on. You see, the King of Rohan is being drained away by Saruman's magic, and the Dark Wizard's minion, Wormtongue, is feeding his majesty with lies that tap into his fears. There's a sense of injustice across the kingdom, with Wormtongue even exiling the king's nephew to retain power and take advantage of his highness's beautiful niece, Eowyn. That's the fascinating thing about Wormtongue. He's more than just the villain's lackey. He's taking his own benefits from playing a part in dominating Rohan. And he's clearly enjoying gaining control, while also remaining loyal to his master's command. Character actor Brad Dourif, best known for voicing Chucky the Killer Doll, brings a slimy and conniving malice to the role, but also an elegant theatricality. He's not just this snivelling minion, he tries to have poetic class to the way he talks, and it's this arrogant pretension that makes us despise him even more. Late is the hour in which this conjurer chooses to appear. Last spell I name him, ill news is an ill guest. With Wormtongue and Saruman taking over Rohan, there's this sorrowful atmosphere across the kingdom, like a fog of sadness and lost hope. This is what makes us really want someone to save these people and convince them that their loyal king isn't being himself. The lengths the film goes to fill us with doubt is what makes our hero success all the more bountiful and satisfying. How does this happen? Well, first of all, in an amazing twist, Gandalf has returned under the new identity of Gandalf the White. It turns out that this wizard is a spirit sent by the Undying Lands, someone to guide Middle-earth. After defeating the Balrog, Gandalf died from exhaustion, wounds and burns, but he's been sent back to finish his mission. While you could easily argue that Gandalf's resurrection is an example of Deus Ex Machina, I wouldn't say that it's a meaningless cop-out. The appearance of Gandalf the White is more of a spiritual event, a miracle for Middle-earth to witness at a time where they're suffering and losing hope. Tolkien was a very passionate Christian and even said that the life of Christ was the greatest story ever told. So it makes sense that he would give Gandalf this almost angelic role with messiah undertones. I will admit that I spent a lot of time wrestling with my feelings about Gandalf's resurrection because one of my major pet peeves when it comes to storytelling is cancelling death, but when you put it in a more religious frame of context, it's easier to digest. It's Gandalf's return that triggers a new hope for Rohan. 
giving its people a heroic wizard who has grown even stronger since resurrecting. Gandalf not only releases Saruman's grip on the king, but also proves to the people of Rohan that his majesty wasn't himself. From Wormtongue being kicked out of the palace with all the grace and dignity of a discarded insect, and we get everything that we've been waiting for. It's an uplifting conclusion to all the pain that Saruman's hold on the king put Rohan through, one of the rare moments of victory in the film, and it only means this much to us because we sat through Rohan at the lowest time. While this movie is definitely darker and grittier compared to the first film, it still does a good job finding the silver lining to all the melancholy. For example, Aragorn and Arwen sadly part ways in this film, because Aragorn doesn't want the immortal elf to suffer from eternal grief after he dies, and hopes she can live forever peacefully in Valinor. I am mortal, you are elf kind. It was a dream. However, while Aragorn is helping the people of Rohan, he befriends Eowyn, and the two share a hint of chemistry. Eowyn is maybe better suited for Aragorn, as she's a mortal willing to join the war, and Aragorn supports her right to carry a sword, even though women aren't allowed to fight in Middle-earth. There's a mutual respect that foreshadows a strong romance, showing that love can still exist in Aragorn's life in spite of Arwen's departure. What do you fear, my lady? Cage. To stay behind bars until youth and old age accept them. And all chance of valor has gone beyond recall or desire. You're a daughter of kings. A shield maiden of Rohan. I do not think that will be your fate. Even though our hero's adventure is long and winding, Gimli the Dwarf balances out the focused elegance of Legolas and laid-back confidence of Aragorn with a comic relief role, struggling to catch up with his friends or being accidentally clumsy. Yes, his constant tomfoolery may be grating at times, and perhaps you'll get tired of his antics when you're deeply invested in the dark atmosphere, but I think it's good to have a character who doesn't take things too seriously, because it changes up the dynamic and provides humour as a coping mechanism. But the best example of how the film brings a glimmer of light to everything that's happening is Sam's speech. This speech is fantastically written and wonderfully performed by actor Sean Astin. It addresses the harsh reality of what's happening in Middle Earth at this time, but also tries so hard to be optimistic at the same time. How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing. This shadow, even darkness must pass. Now, while this film is a middle chapter in the trilogy, it does have its own finale, and boy is it an amazing climax. You see, when Saruman sends his army towards Rohan, the king evacuates everyone to Helm's Deep an incredibly strong fortress that has been used for many, many battles. Unfortunately, with the king's nephew and his men exiled, there's not enough soldiers to defend Rohan, and the king resorts to assigning every single male in the role of soldier, regardless of age or experience. The build-up to the orcs' invasion is stomach-churning, as we see the elderly and children being thrust into war, while their families cry in fear, and the king struggles to believe in success for this battle. It also doesn't help that he's been facing grief after losing his son while he was under Saruman's control. Sedra's death was not of your making. No parents should have to bury their child. Even Legolas expresses doubt in this fight, creating tension with Aragorn in the process, who is adamant that Rohan has to at least try to defend themselves, something that ties greatly into this franchise's message of finding hope in hard times. We have trusted you this far, you have not led us astray. Forgive me, I was wrong to despair. When the battle finally takes place, it's one hell of a cinematic action set piece. 
The sheer scale of the conflict is a sight to behold, because there's so, so, so many extras, each putting their all into the film sequence, despite how heavy the costumes are or uncomfortable the makeup feels. This battle will make your jaw drop, because it just keeps on going relentlessly, every shot being vividly intense and packed with heaps of actors performing combat on a rainy set. Although, as savage as this epic battle is, there are moments of positivity amid all the mayhem. Like, in a miraculous turn of events, the elves decide to join this war, boldly contributing their legendary archery to the disadvantaged Rohan and reuniting races after men betrayed the elves by not disposing the ring. After all the despair that Rohan has been facing, there's a powerful feeling of optimism created by the very presence of the elves, because it shows that Middle-earth can work together against Saruman and Sauron. There's also a little comedy sprinkled into the battle, with Gimli and Legolas competing for kill counts. Their cheeky rivalry is both a great example of using humour to stay strong, and a funny way to foreshadow their growing friendship despite Gimli's obvious prejudice towards elves. <laughs> Now, a common criticism against this scene, and the films in general, is that Legolas comes off as too perfect when it comes to his combat and archery. The thing is, he doesn't really do anything too unrealistic or impossible. And it's important to remember that he's an immortal elf. He's had centuries of time to gain experience and train himself. So, of course, he's going to have super abilities and instincts. Sure, his immense lack of flaws can make him hard to relate to. It is difficult to resonate with a character who's never outmatched, never misses a shot, and never gets scathed. But as shallow as I possibly sound saying this, it's really cool watching him in action. I did say that this film is darker than The Fellowship of the Ring, but it's still following the franchise's theme of light in the darkness. So don't expect a sad ending, more of a bittersweet one. Treebeard leads the Ents into battle with Merry and Pippin on his shoulders, plus Gandalf enters the war with the King's nephew and his army. So good does triumph by the end, but there's still a reminder that this is all merely the beginning of one long war ahead. The battle for Helm's Deep is over. The battle for Middle-earth is about to begin. All our hopes now lie with two little hobbits. To conclude, The Two Towers has this melancholic charm to me. It's full of gritty violence and sad tragedy, but still retains the franchise's message of being optimistic even when things seem over. Its consistent theme of finding trust in a world being consumed by evil certainly helps tie everything together. I didn't like it as much as The Fellowship of the Ring, because it's missing a lot of the wholesomeness that I loved about the first film, and the heavy plotting did overwhelm me at times. But I still really enjoyed it, and appreciate the effort that went into making a pretty entertaining middle chapter. I've been Jamboreeki, and I hope that you enjoyed this review. If you did, then feel free to like, subscribe, and share. Also, please consider clicking the notification bell to be alerted when I have released a new video. So, what am I going to be reviewing in the next episode of Jamboreeki Orange? Well, that's entirely up to my patrons. The options for the next episode include... Inception, Uncut Gems, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, Heavy Traffic, The Secret of Nim 2, and The Proud Family Movie. Now, don't forget that you have to be a patron in order to access this poll. What is a patron? Don't worry, I'll explain. This is my Patreon. It's a site for my fans to support me financially on through a monthly basis. Those who donate are called patrons. Patrons can donate as much as they want and are welcome to stop donating any time. In return for their generosity, patrons are given exciting rewards based on their pledge amount. These rewards include early access to my videos before they go up publicly on YouTube, behind the scenes content, their name in the end credits of my videos, a chance to request a review of anything at all, and much more. Pretty excited to find out what my patrons want me to do next on the show. Cheerio, folks.